On Sunday, 10th March 2019, during an Israeli cabinet meeting, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu insisted that Israel is, quote, a Jewish democratic state, unquote. Yet that it was also, quote, a nation state not of all its citizens, but only of the Jewish people, unquote. Netanyahu's statements are very much anchored in the country's legal system and are in no way a violation of Israel's core commitment to legally privileging Jewish citizens over non-Jewish citizens. While this has been legal practice since 1948, the July 2018 nation-state law reiterated these basic Israeli legal principles. In reaffirming principles of Israeli law, the nation-state basic law uh, tells us, inter alia, that of the exclusive Jewish symbolism of the flag and of the national anthem and of national holidays, the ingathering of the diaspora Jews, the adoption of the Jewish Sabbath as the weekly official holiday, and of the Hebrew calendar as the official calendar. What is new in the law, however, are two claims made in the first section titled Basic Principles. It is in Article 1a that the law introduces a new legal term when it refers not to the state of Israel, but to the land of Israel. The land of Israel is the historical homeland, it tells us, of the Jewish people in which the state of Israel was established. While Article 1b, which states that, quote, the state of Israel is the national home of the Jewish people and not of its Israeli citizens of all ethnicities and religions, is not new, the article does not only define what the state of Israel encompasses and what identity it should have, but specifically it refers to the land of Israel, which encompasses all of mandatory Palestine and the Golan Heights for all wings of the Zionist movement, and also includes Jordan in the case of the revisionist Zionists, of which the ruling Likud coalition party is today's representative. The land of Israel is an important and old ideological claim for Zionism. However, making it a legal claim is novel and encroaches on the sovereignty of neighboring Jordan and Syria and violates the Geneva Conventions in laying claim to these territories, in addition to the Palestinian West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. But the law introduces another key novel claim in Articles 1b and 1c, one that the Zionist movement and Israel have never made before, namely, and I quote, that the state of Israel is the national home of the Jewish people in which it fulfills its historical right to self-determination, unquote. This is in 1b, and quote that the right to exercise national, that to exercise national self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people, unquote. This is Article 1c. Self-determination has never been advanced either as a legal principle or as a right by the Zionist movement or by Israeli law previously. Indeed, it was not mentioned in key Zionist ideological documents historically. What, then, is the purpose of invoking the right of self-determination in the new law? The Zionist movement has argued, often, that establishing a Jewish state for world Jewry was a moral and historical necessity that must be protected and enshrined in law, something it tirely, it tirelessly pursued over the decades. However, this did not mean that its foundational texts proceeded from this juridical or moral principle. Indeed, in his two foundational texts, and I, I will give you a historical background, in Der Judenstaat, The State of the Jews, and in his novel Old New Land, Theodor Herzl, the father of Zionism, never invoked the notion of Jewish rights to argue for a state of and for the Jews. Herzl did speak of a solution to the Jewish question, but not of a right. And neither did the first Zionist Congress, Congress that Herzl convened in 1897, and the Basel program it issued, which did not cite such a right. This also applies to the three international foundational texts that Zionism worked hard to bring about. The first such text, the Balfour Declaration, issued on November 2nd, 1917 by the British government, rather than use the language of rights, used the language of affect promising that the British government, and I quote, views with favor, unquote, the establishment in Palestine of a Jewish national home, and that its declaration was, quote, a declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, unquote. This was followed by the League of Nations mandate for Palestine issued in 1922, which based itself on the Balfour Declaration and also did not recognize any Jewish rights to a state 
uh, uh, in Palestine. What it did recognize was, and I quote, the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine as the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. Again, asserting, like the Balfour Declaration before it, that this should not prejudice the rights of non-Jews. The third and major text, the November 1947 partition plan issued by the United Nations General Assembly, proceeded from a moral preamble, namely that the General Assembly considered, and I quote, that the present situation in Palestine is one which is likely to impair the general welfare and friendly relations among nations, and hence, unquote, and hence the need to provide a solution to what they called the problem of Palestine. Now, unlike these Zionist and international foundational documents, which did not employ the language of rights, the Zionist movement insisted on its use in its own foundational document of the state, namely Israel's so-called Declaration of Independence, which formally, in fact, is titled the Declaration of the Establishment of the State of Israel. The declaration, which was signed, incidentally, by 37 Jewish leaders, 35 of whom were European colonists, and only one of whom was born in Palestine, misinforms us that, quote, in the year, this is the Declaration of Independence, or the establishment of the state. In the year 1897, at the summons of the spiritual father of the Jewish state, Theodore Herzl, the first Zionist Congress convened and proclaimed the right of the Jewish people to national rebirth in its own country, unquote. As the documentary record shows, however, neither Herzl nor the Zionist Congress proclaimed such a right at all. Yet the Declaration of Independence proceeds to tell us that, quote, this right was recognized in the Balfour Declaration of the 2nd November 1917 and reaffirmed in the mandate of the League of Nations, which in particular gave international sanction to the historic connection between the Jewish people and Eretz Israel and to the right of the Jewish people to rebuild its national home. On the 29th of November 1947, this is the declaration still, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution calling for the establishment of a Jewish state. The General Assembly required the inhabitants of Eretz Israel to take such steps as were necessary on their part for the implementation of that resolution. This recognition by the United Nations of the right of the Jewish people to establish their state is irrevocable." Unquote. None of these documents, in fact, as none of these documents has affirmed such a right at all, the imputation of them that they did falls more in the realm of Zionist investment in the new language of international relations within which the notion of rights became enshrined after World War II, not least in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This also coincided with the emergence of rights discourse in the same period as the hegemonic form of claims making. Indeed, Israel's so-called Declaration of Independence is so invested in this mode of argumentation that invo it invokes the European Enlightenment's notion of natural rights when it asserts in its preamble that, quote, this right to a Jewish state is the natural right of the Jewish people to be masters of their own fate, like all other nations in their own sovereign state, unquote. The, former, the, the, the framers of the Declaration concluded that by virtue of, quote, our natural and historic right, and on the strength of the resolution of the UN General Assembly, hereby declare the, estab the establishment of the Jewish state in Eretz Israel to be known as the State of Israel, unquote. It's important to point out that the logic of this document is its insistence that its invocation of the Jews' right to establish a Jewish state in Palestine has a clear legal and moral genealogy, of which it is merely the conclusion, and that such a right was finally granted irrevocably, as it says, by the partition plan. That none of this was true did not deter the framers, who in asserting a right they arrogated to themselves, were now instituting a mode of argumentation that would be the most powerful rhetoric in establishing Israeli facts on the ground. However, establishing the Zionist movement's right to Palestine was more in line with a two-century European tradition that used to be called the right of conquest, which European colonial settlers have invoked to justify settler colonialism, whether in the Americas and Oceania, in the African settler colonies, and now in Asia. Israel's invocation of its right of conquest in its 1948 document must be seen within these important European precedents. In the early part of the 20th century, the South African white colonial settler leader, Jan Smuts, 
recorded or recoded rather the right of conquest as the right of self-determination. This is, people sometimes think self-determination as an anti-colonial notion. There is that part from Lenin, but in fact it was used, it was invoked by Jan Smuts. He's the one who actually coined it and gave it to Woodrow Wilson. So essentially self-determination was always a white colonial settler notion and principle. So it's very important to remember this. Um, uh, so, uh, the right to self-determination, which Jan Smuts applied to the white colonial settlers of South Africa, and which soon would be followed by white settlers in Rhodesia and Kenya, among others. The French colonial settlers, the Biennois of Algeria, were earlier converts to this understanding, when in 1870, and through the Camus decree, they established settler colonial rights and autonomy. Whereas the right to self-determination would take another trajectory when appropriated by the colonized between the 1920s and 1960s, the United States intervened at the United Nations in 1970 to reframe the right to self-determination as one that applied to colonized people, but not to indigenous populations and settler colonies, where in the latter, the US insisted, could access local municipal rights but none that would threaten the sovereignty and unity of the existing settler colonial state. In light of these new US modifications, Israeli leaders began to speak intermittently of recognizing that the Palestinians in the 1967 occupied territories, but of course not those in Israel or those refugees Israel expelled, but that only Palestinians in the 67 territories could make a similar claim to self-determination. In the Israeli case, the question of self-determination was never raised as a legal principle and was always marginal in Zionist ideological posturing. For the European Jewish colonists, self-determination would be translated to Hebrew from the Russian as the right of self-definition, or as a chut le smit. The term first appeared in Hebrew in 1905 as a translation, but had been in use since the 1920s with the pronounced rise during the, ter the terrorist war that the Zionist militias launched against the British occupation authorities in the early 1940s through 1948. But not unlike the rise of the concept among South African white colonial settlers following the Boer War in which they fought the British Empire and which led to the British establishment of the Union of South Africa in 1910, as a British dominion with white self-government, European Jewish colonists began to use self-determination in earnest when they parted ways with their British colonial masters. Nonetheless, the principle or right of Jewish self-determination was never mentioned in any of the laws of the State of Israel. It would take seven decades before the nation state law would codify Jewish self-determination as a right. In contrast, Palestinians demanded the right of self-determination as early as 1918 in petitions and documents presented to the British authorities opposing Zionism and referencing both US President Woodrow Wilson and British Prime Minister David Lloyd George's support of it as articulated by Jan Smuts as early as May 1918 and later in a statement presented by the Palestinian delegation to the Paris Peace Conference on 3rd February 1919, and most importantly, by the Palestinian delegation, um, uh, sorry, most importantly in the Declaration of the Independence of Syria, which was issued on 8th March 1920. In contrast, the Zionists did not, but uh, actually did not uh, invoke it, but proceeded to undercut and oppose the Palestinian right to self-determination as one that, if granted, would undermine the colonial settler project, as I showed earlier in my keynote today. The earliest writings, of, or the, the earliest stirrings, I should say, of Israeli uh, invocations of the expression Israeli self-determination was made in the context of the recognition of Palestinian self-determination, which was expressed by Israel's foreign minister, the South African-born uh, Abba Ibn, in September 1972, when he declared, and I quote, that there is a Palestinian people who are part of the Arab world, this does not, this does not mean that this people should be allowed self-determination 100%, as there exist 16 Arab states that enjoy a great deal of self-determination, but there are no 16 Hebrew states. Consequently, Israeli self-determination should take moral and historical precedence, he says, over Palestinian self-determination, though it does not rule it out entirely. Unquote. 
Then the Israelis continue to insist, however, that the Palestinian Arabs, and this is uh, uh, done even by Iban, the Palestinian Arabs have long enjo enjoyed self-determination in their own state, the so-called Palestinian Arab state of Jordan, to which Israel had expelled a majority of them in 48 and 67. Uh, yet, Iban's invocation of Israeli self-determination was novel in this regard and reformulated what the Zionists used to call simply autonomy in the 1920s. What has emerged in the last decade, however, was its modification from the claim of Israeli self-determination, which would have included presumably Israel's Palestinian population, into what is now referred to as Jewish self-determination, something that should be granted to any nation regardless of its numbers. And here it doesn't say Israeli Jewish self-determination, but Jewish self-determination worldwide. This new claim has become so important for Israel that the recent International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism, that Israel and its lobby are forcing European um, uh, countries and the British to adopt, insists that, quote, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination is anti-Semitic. The new claim is very much based, as I said earlier today, on Israeli leaders' sober acknowledgement of the demographic status of Jews in recent years as a perpetual minority in the state of Israel. This is then the motivation behind this recent claim. If a Jewish state with a right of conquest necessitated a Jewish demographic majority, which could be achieved through expulsion of the Palestinians, an exclusive Jewish right to self-determination need not dabble with the question of demographic majority or minority. On the contrary, it is precisely the realization on the part of the Israeli leadership that Jews will never again be a demographic majority in the state of Israel or in the land of Israel that necessitated the recognition of the Jewish supremacist right to both, regardless of their numbers, through invoking exclusive Jewish self-determination as a legal principle. The nation-state law essentially has ensured that Jewish supremacy can now be established without ever having to worry about the number of Jews inhabiting the land or the state of Israel. Claims of democracy have served their public relations purposes when demographic transformation could be enforced through the right of conquest. Now that it can no longer be enforced, it is self-determination that will guide and guarantee the future of Jewish supremacy in Israel and all its conquered territories. Thank you.